the words proximal and distal are opposites. And you have to understand when you use these terms that you're referring to proximal or close to or near to a joint or a point of attachment, distal or far away from a point of attachment. So proximal means closer to the origin of the body part or the point of attachment of a limb to the body trunk. We typically use proximal and distal to refer to um, the shoulder joint or the hip joint. So we can say, for example, in um, if you're referring to the shoulder joint as the point of attachment, the elbow is proximal to the wrist. That means the elbow is closer to the shoulder than the wrist is. The elbow is proximal to the wrist. Now you could turn that around and you could say the wrist is distal to the elbow. That means the wrist is further away from the shoulder joint than the elbow is. And distal that's what, that's what distal means, is that it's further away from the point of attachment. So now we can use the hip joint as an example here. The knee is distal to the thigh. So the knee is further away from the hip than the thigh is. And you could turn that around and say the thigh is proximal to the knee. That means the thigh is closer to the hip than the knee is. So proximal and distal are a little bit hard to get used to because we don't really use those words in everyday language. It's not, it's not as comfortable um, as some of these other terms are. Now, superficial and deep are opposite. Superficial refers to closer to the surface or external. The skin is superficial to the skeletal muscles. And deep refers to internal away from the body surface. The lungs are deep to the skin. And we, we use these terms also, um, like when we're referring to a cut, if you got, you know, if you got a, a wound or a cut, we could say it's a superficial cut if it just barely um, pierced the skin. But it's a deep cut if it pierced the skin and some of the um, deeper tissues. And it probably hurts more although a superficial paper cut can hurt. All right, regional terms. There are two major body divisions. There's the axial and the appendicular. And we also use this to refer to the skeleton, axial skeleton, and the appendicular skeleton. The axial refers to the head, neck, and trunk. And the appendicular refers to the limbs, your legs and arms. And then we have regional terms that designate specific areas. So you need to know figure 1.8a and one uh, this next one, let's see how they, figure 1.8b. All right, so um, let's go back to 1.8a and I will um, do my best to pronounce all these terms for you. All right, cephalic refers to the head region. Frontal refers to the forehead region. Orbital, the eye region. Nasal, the nose region. Buccal, the cheek region. Oral, the mouth region. And mental is the chin region. Cervical is the neck region. Thoracic is going to be the chest area. Sternal is the breastbone region, which the bone here is called the sternum. So that's where that comes from. Axillary is the armpit. Mammary is the... Um, the breast, abdominal, the abdominal region is here in purple and um, umbilical refers to here where the, um, the belly button or the navel. And then you have the pelvic region and the inguinal region or groin. Then you have the pubic region or genital region. Okay, and that's everything on the left side. I think, yeah. So now let's go to the right side and the terms on the right side of the figure. Notice that this the guy in this figure um, is in the anatomical position. Notice how the palms are facing forward and the thumbs are, are um, pointing laterally or to the side. Now the upper limb, the acromial region, 
is here, the acromial region. So it's like at the, the on top of your shoulder. The brachial region is also called the arm in anatomy. The lower arm is not called the arm, it is called the forearm. So brachial, antecubital is the um, bend in your elbow. So it's in front of your elbow, anterior to your elbow, <laughs> antecubital. And then they have the word, it doesn't have a line, um, a, di a line pointing to this because it's on the um, back side, but olecranal is the, um, the term for the elbow, okay? So we'll see that on the posterior figure. Antibrachial is the forearm, the carpal is the wrist, the hand is manus, the metacarpal is the palm, and, and that includes, um, the metacarpal is, uh, includes the palmar region, the polex, which is the thumb, and then the digital region, which is the other fingers. Then we have the lower limb. This is the coxal region or hip region, the femoral region or thigh, patellar is the kneecap, and back of the knee is the popliteal region. The leg is going to be opposite of how we refer to arm. Arm is the upper arm. Leg is the lower leg. Okay, what, what, the, what we would call the upper leg is the thigh. So the leg is the crural region. That's hard to say, so say it a few times out loud. Crural. The crural region is the leg, and then the calf on the posterior side is sural. Um, the lateral side of the leg is the fibular or uh, peroneal region. Fibular is, is a more common. Then the pedal region is the foot, and that includes the ankle, which is tarsal. And then the heel is calcaneal, which that will be on the posterior figure. Metatarsal is the top of the foot. And then you have the digital, which is the all of the toes except the big toe. The, the big toe or great toe is called the hallux. So you need to learn all these. So whatever you need to do to learn all these terms, you need to be able to um, say them, point to your own body or um, a friend or a family member and say these terms um, without looking. You need to know them very, very well, okay? Um, how to say them, how to spell them, just know them backwards and forwards. Now, this is the posterior view of the same figure. And so we can still see on the left side, we can still see the acromial region, which is the shoulder, the brachial, antecubital, um, you can't see, which is the bend in the elbow, which is on the anterior view. But you can see the elbow region, which is called the olecranal. The antibrachial is the forearm, the carpal is the wrist, and you can see all the same structures in the manus or the hand. Metacarpal um, and digital, you can see the polex. I don't know why it doesn't have a line to it. Um, but since you're looking at the um, back of the hand, you, you wouldn't call that palmar. Okay, now the lower limb, you can see, um, you, you can't really see the hips from the back side as well. So the coxal, you can't see as well, but you can still see the femoral or thigh. You can't see the kneecap or patellar region, but you can see the popliteal or back of the knee. You can't see the crural, but you can see the sural, the calf. You can see the lateral side of the leg or the fibular region. And you can see um, the calcaneal region on the foot, and you can see the plantar region on the foot. All right, on the right side of the page, um, you can see the ears are the otic region. The back of the head is the occipital region. When we learn the bones, the, the bone that's, that's there in the skull is called the occipital bone. The neck is still cervical. The upper portion of the back is called, or the back in general is the dorsal region, but this portion here where the scapula or um, what we call the shoulder blades is, is called the scapular region. And then where the vertebrae are, where the spine is, we call that the vertebral region. The lower back is the lumbar region. The sacral region is below that. 
the um, buttocks are the gluteal region. And then between the anus and external geni genitalia is called the perennial region. Repair, hold on. Okay, so perennial region. All right. Body planes and sections. Um, body planes are surfaces along which the body or structures may be cut for anatomical study. So if we talk about the body being cut, um, there are three planes that you need to know, a sagittal plane, a frontal or coronal plane, and a transverse or horizontal plane. Um, so a sagittal plane divides the body vertically into right and left parts. If it's mid-sagittal or median plane, then it's perfectly made on the midline of the body. But if it's a parasagittal plane, then it was off-centered. But it's still going to divide the body into left and right halves. A frontal or coronal plane divides the body vertically into anterior and posterior parts. It's called frontal because it makes a front and a back. It produces a frontal or coronal section. A transverse or horizontal plane is like a cross section. Um, it divides the body into superior and inferior parts, a top and a bottom. And an oblique section is a cut at an angle. So this shows you, a, there's a glass kind of, um, but, you know, kind of dividing the body so that you can see what, what each plane looks like. So a mid-sagittal plane or a median plane would look like picture A. A frontal or coronal plane would look like picture B. See how it divides the body into a front and a back? And then a transverse plane would look like picture C. And then when you look at MRI scans, you, you can see what um, they would look like in a mid-sagittal plane, in a frontal plane, and in a transverse plane. Section 1.6 has body cavities and membranes. The body contains internal cavities that are closed to the environment. The cavities provide different degrees of protection to organs within them. And we've got two main sets of body cavities, the dorsal and the ventral. The dorsal body cavity protects the nervous system. And there are two subdivisions, the cranial and the vertebral. And as you can see here, the dorsal body cavity is shown in yellow and it encloses the brain and the uh, spinal cord. Then you have the ventral body cavity, which includes the um, thoracic cavity, and then the abdominal cavity and the pelvic cavity. And it's the diaphragm is the muscle that divides the thoracic and the abdominal cavities. Another thing that you can see from the anterior view shown in um, picture figure B is you can see this, um, this area in between the lungs called the mediastinum. The superior mediastinum is here. Um, and then the, um, you can see the heart lies within the mediastinum, which is between the two lungs. And then the two lungs lie within the pleural cavities. Then here's your diaphragm and you have your abdominal cavity and your pelvic cavity. The ventral body cavity in the notes houses the internal organs called the viscera. So internal organs like the liver and the stomach and the intestines. Um, it's divided into thoracic and abdominopelvic cavities. The thoracic cavity contains the two pleural cavities. Each pleural cavity surrounds one lung. The mediastinum contains the pericardial cavity, which surrounds the heart. And then the other thoracic organs within the mediastinum are the esophagus, the trachea, um, the, uh, gosh, uh, thymus gland. The pericardial cavity encloses the heart again. And then the abdominal cavity contains the stomach, intestine, spleen, and liver. The pelvic cavity contains the bladder, urinary bladder, um, some of the internal reproductive organs, and the rectum. And here's a clinical note um, of dealing with homeostatic imbalance. And this one is dealing with the uh, hiatal hernia. So problems can occur when structures stray into neighboring cavities. An example is a hiatal hernia. 
Um, and this is when part of the stomach protrudes through the diaphragm into the thoracic cavity, and it can push stomach acid into the esophagus, causing irritation, um, which we know as heartburn or acid reflux. And se severe cases require surgery to repair. All right, there are membranes located in the ventral body cavity. There are three different ones that you need to be familiar with. They're called serous membranes or serosa. They are double-layered membranes. They have a, an outer layer called the parietal serosa and then an inner layer called the visceral serosa. The visceral layer always covers the organs. Whatever organs are being protected by that um, serous membrane, it's the visceral layer that covers those organs. Then the parietal layer is outside of that. So the visceral actually contacts the organs within that cavity and the parietal doesn't. Um, between the visceral and parietal layers, um, there is serous fluid. All right, so these are the three uh, serous membranes. And I don't know why this isn't in bold, but pericardium, which is the membrane that encloses the heart, the pleura encloses the lungs, and then the peritoneum encloses the abdominopelvic cavity. So three serous membranes, pericardium, the pleura, and the peritoneum. And this is how they work. If you can look at this picture and just imagine punching your fist into a balloon, there would be part of that balloon that is touching your fist. Then you would have a layer of air. Then you would have part of that balloon that doesn't touch your, your fist. So the part that touches your fist is comparable to the visceral layer. And the part that's outside is comparable to the parietal layer. And this works for any of those three um, serous membranes. So look at the pericardium in picture B and make sure you know where the visceral pericardium actually touches the heart. Then you have pericardial fluid in between the two layers, and then you have the parietal pericardium that lines the um, wall of the pericardial cavity. So clinical homeostatic imbalance, um, example number two, Serous membranes can become inflamed as a result of infection or other causes. And when that happens, um, it says normally smooth layers can become rough and even can stick together. And that is that causes excruciating pain. Examples are the conditions called pleurisy and peritonitis. And these are um, conditions. Pleurisy is um, inflammation involving the pleura that surround the lungs. Peritonitis is inflammation of the peritoneum that surrounds the abdominal cavity.